Hello and welcome. I'm Eric Miskell and welcome to this edition of the Eric Miskell Show. Our topic today is Industry 4.0. Um, before we get into that, let me cover a couple of quick housekeeping issues for our audience. Um, you are all on mute, so feel free to be as loud as you want in your own environment, uh, but we will not be bothered by it. Um, this session is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on EMS Now probably next Monday as the feature. And lastly, and most importantly, questions. Um, we encourage questions from the audience for, for our guests today. Uh, please use the question tab at the bottom of the screen if you wish to pose anything. We will probably save those for near the end, um, but we encourage you to, to pose any questions you might have of our guests. As always, uh, I am joined by Phil Stoughton, uh, the man from down under in Australia, uh, who hasn't left there in over a year now. So um, good that's to right. See you it's been a long right. time. Yeah. Good um, to see you, Eric. Yeah, our topic today is Industry 4.0, and specifically what we're calling kind of executing on Industry 4.0. And kind of industry, the topic, Industry 4.0, has gotten a lot of attention over the years. Um, it's also gotten some criticism, and we hear people saying, calling it a kind of a, a solution in search of a problem. Um, but yet we knew that problems were being solved in, in the process, and we wanted to, to invite some people who could speak directly to that. Um, which brings me to our guest today. Uh, we have with us uh, Jason Sparrow with a Aegis Software and Alex Chassels with Dorigo Systems. Both of these gentlemen uh, can speak to this issue both about, you know, to share kind of what they've done and also uh, give us some insights on, on how this can be adopted and used effectively in the industry. So, so gentlemen, welcome both of you. As always, I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourselves and your companies for the benefit of the audience. And Alex, since I'm looking in the mirror when I see you, I figure I'll start with you. Yeah. Well, great, great, great to be here. And it is unusual to be on this side of the camera. I've, I've watched so many of, of the episodes, a great program. Um, so my name is Alex Chassels. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Dorigo Systems. Um, a bit unusual, I spent the past 20 years working at OEMs, um, really focused on the value chain. So resourcing, outsourcing, low cost countries, um, right through to skunk work projects and how to use AI for planning, um, which is always a big topic. You could go on for days on that. Um, and in that experience, I always kept trying to look into the EMS industry and it was so opaque, right? And I, I felt there weren't levels of trust there. And this is 20 years of working with mm -hmm. contract manufacturers. And I thought there must be a different way to do this. And on that journey, I discovered this great company, Dorigo Systems, and our wonderful founder, Mark Pilon. And he said, Alex, I understand this. We're growing this company, and I want to maintain those roots and the beliefs that we both have as we grow this company. Um, so I joined Dorigo. We're uh, 130 strong, located in uh, British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, uh, and growing rapidly. Now, Dorigo, our focus kind of, I call it niche industrial niche communications, because they're not often the, the sexy parts of the business. Um, they're not aerospace and defense. Um, we also work in medical, but underneath that, power conversion, managing power systems, and then IoT, which touches all of those, those areas. And we are a full service firm, uh, design, ser uh, you know, design for DFX services um, mm -hmm. through surface mount assembly, everything, uh, depaneling, CNC to, to box build. Um, so we do what a lot of other companies do, but where we differentiate ourselves, and this is why I love being at Dorigo, you have a lot of companies that are operational experts. And I've seen them. They drive milliseconds to save pennies out of their operations, and they're great at that. Then you get companies, EMSs, that are technical experts. And you can pin these on a map where they sit. Dorigo, we are great operationally. We've invested a lot in our technology, but we're pointing all of it towards a customer experience. So if some the team comes in and says, we'd like to invest in this, how will it support what we're calling this, this seamless customer experience? So that's one of our big differentiators. The next one being a, you know, a small to medium sized enterprise and privately owned, our founder is constantly investing back into the business. 
We have leading edge manufacturing equipment. We use great systems like the, the Aegis system. And I'm sitting right behind me. This is our factory, which we moved mm -hmm. into about eight months ago. So custom built 100,000 square foot facility that's supporting our growth. So a lot of investment that way. Um, so a really great company to be a part of and I'm uh, pleased to be on the program. Very good. Well, thank, thank you for that. Alex. Jason, let's give you an opportunity to introduce yourself in ages, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you both for hosting this. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name's Jason Sparra. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Aegis Software. And we're a, um, well, we've been doing this now uh, for uh, over two decades. We're a supplier of what is generally called manufacturing operations management software. Um, so our software provides a singular platform for all the functionality, digital functionality that's needed within the boundary of the operations wall. So uh, we always say that from where design hands off to manufacturing and process engineering and all the activities of the, there to the shop floor itself, intersecting with the warehouse out to shipment and everything in between. Um, something we think that makes us unique is our system was actually built on an IoT backend natively. Uh, because we've been doing machine data acquisition in various forms before IoT was even a word, really, back to 1999-2000 uh, with the machine vendors actually in the electronics assembly space. Um, our solution extends from uh, our root market, because I, I used to actually be a manufacturing engineer in Defense Electronics before founding the company uh, with our CTO. Uh, we, our root market was electronics assembly. And then as customers will do, like Torigo, uh, as the world moved into more uh, value add of the full box assembly and so forth, we moved into full discrete. And now our solution can go from the circuit card all the way up to the assembly of an aircraft and remanufacture of an aircraft, which we actually mm -hmm. support. Uh, we have over 2,200 manufacturing sites using some form of Aegis software worldwide. And we're certainly proud to have Torigo as as one of them. Um, and we have operations of direct staff uh, all around the world to support direct fulfillment of our customers' deployments. Okay, excellent. Um, well, Alex, let me come back to you then. You have, as you indicated, you, you've implemented Aegis's you know, solution there within the fact. So share with us that experience and, and, and how it was and what you did and as part of your overall digital strategy. Yeah, great, Eric. And I'd say we're implementing Aegis because I think it's a, okay. it's a constant evolution and process. And that's part of the big question of, you know, industry 4.0. It's not an end game. It's mm -hmm. it's a continual journey. Um, so part of Dorigo and you have companies that have a strategy and then, you know, Harvard Business Review and PwC start talking about digital strategy and then everyone got confused. And the way we look at it from, from Dorigo's standpoint is we have a goal you know, improve the customer's experience. And that's the first part of, of where you then start to look at the digital, right? What is actually our business goal? Mm -hmm. What do our customers think about our goals and does it align with their needs? And then you start to say, what are our processes today and how do you intertwine this notion of digital? And it's from, you know, big data, uh, robotics, simulations, you, you talk of the digital twin and those aspects. So we have a multi-year roadmap going through this and. We've, we've, we've used the, I'd say the legacy Aegis system. So we're aware of it. We said, what's the biggest, best first step we can take here? Do we get wowed? And I'm easily wowed by anything that says robotics in it or automation. Um, and my team have to pull me back. I say, do we get wowed with the technology first or the system? And I think the team's made a great decision here to be, to implement the system. And that's where we started to go through because we see value from uh, Aegis and Factory Logics. It impacts the people in a positive fashion. It streamlines our processes, uh, and then connects with our great technology here. You know, whether it be the Co Young equipment, the Panasonic machines, uh, we can harvest wow. all that data. So we went through, develop, developed a plan around this, um, and it took us about about twelve months. And most of that time was spent in the initial planning phases. How are we going to roll this out? And how are we going to address, address it with the staff? Um, and we made the decision to do this multi-phase and we're, we're still working through this, but we've implemented what Factory Logics or Aegis calls their engineering module. The engineering module is really the keystone module where it's, I mean, it's an incredible system. You set workflows, 
and I say standard workflows, but you can have any number of standard workflows. So it's really flexible. You come up with your document libraries for everything. So, you know, it's, I don't know if it's plug and play is the right word for the system, but it's easy to create new products and parts as they're coming in. So a customer comes in, we quote our products and there's a lot of things you can do with that to automate that. Um, and we take the CAD data and we start producing these digital work instructions all the way through the steps, assigning parts to each area, assigning what level of quality inspection we wanna do. And it is pure digital. Two years ago at Dorigo, we had stacks of paper like that, times that throughout the building, job folders going across, right? Then you had to stamp, you know, non-controlled for the ones if a product got ahead of itself and all of that has gone away. So the, the first part, the engineering is where we set everything up and then you get into the production uh, module. The production modules where we're really gathering all this great data. So if I'm an, I'm an operator on the factory floor and I see nesters over my shoulder on that side, he scans himself into the system and it brings up essentially a workbench. That workbench identifies what his is, what is job is today, what his priority is today, and gives very clear specific instructions, common language, right? Um, which is one of the challenges we had to overcome before. Of our six product engineers, they all like to build things a bit differently, but this standardized that, which helps the communications to the factory floor. So Nestor scans into the system, he starts the operation, and we start finding out how long is it taking. We start to understand through some of the X-Link technology, are we seeing any failures coming off of our SPI or AOI? And it's all actionable data. And this mm -hmm. is what's so great about this system. Um, my favorite part as a, I don't wanna call this a seagull manager who flies by, but I love going to the factory floor, pressing the I got a problem button, entering a problem and seeing how long it takes for a product engineer to show up and solve the problem. And they're pretty good at it, but that's another great feature. We should never believe we know more than the factory workers. We may have different understandings than that, but when you go down there and they say, Alex, why was I told to do it this way? And I say, well, let's give feedback through the system into this queue to do continual improvement. It's, it's really exceptional. So we've got the engineering done. We're now in production, running through the whole operation, getting timing data, quality data, and then it's the analytics module. And that's where we're pulling the information um, you know, you can have cycle time studies, defective parts from all of these different bits of information and start taking action on those. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the big benefits of, of the information. Now I can take action to improve. Um, we combine that though with uh, Power BI. So our entire business is on analytics. Um, so we can see the entire business pulling also from factory logics. Hmm. And what's incredible, I can see, I'm pointing the wrong way, but on that screen back there, Mm -hmm. And on my phone, from anywhere, any of the team can pull, put in a customer name, we have over 100 customers, yeah. see where the job is, what operation on the factory floor, how it's flowing, and it then makes the customer communication so much easier. Yeah. And our next step in that process is going to be exposing that to the customers. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge, Alex. And that was something I was really interested in um, during this part, but also in your introduction, you come from an OEM background. Uh, you talk about driving value for your customers. When you built your industry 4.0 strategy or you, you aligned your business strategy with, um, with, with your digital strategy, what were you looking to drive as specific values to your customers? And what are the biggest customer values that you've, that you've already driven from that initiative? The, the biggest customer value we see is transparency. And that was, and you have costing transparency, right? And we're approaching that in a, in a slightly different, fa different fashion, but it's where, where is my product? What challenges are you facing with that product? And what solution are you proposing to Rego? And it changes the conversation. Um, it's not, where's my product? Why is it late? It's, mm -hmm. we see an issue in the value chain. And we're, you know, we're only looking right now from the inventory room, you know, through to out the door. Uh, we need to expand on that, but it's, it's just a much different conversation. Phil, uh, your product right now is in SMT. We see tombstoning on the part that's been brought up through the factory logic system. We believe it's going to lead to a two day delay. And with the logistics module, which is our next step with factory logics, we'll start to be able to, you know, predict when that end date is mm -hmm. here, are the steps we're taking, 
how does that impact your operation and do the steps we're taking meet your needs? Like it's, okay. it's creating intimacy, right? And I think the big, we are a business, we wanna make money. We see the best way to do that is really an empathetic, connected customer experience. That's, yeah. that's our focus. If we're, we're meeting that, the rest happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that transparency as being huge. And from an OEM perspective, I see more and more OEMs demanding that. Are you seeing that, Jason, in the in the kind of general environment? Are you do you feel more connected with the OEMs as well as with the EMS in terms of what they need from the system? Uh, yeah, actually, our customer base is about 50 50 OEM uh, EMS. And <clears throat> it is true that that it's interesting the way Alex talks about it, because I, I was thinking through so many different meetings I've been in, is there are two ways people approach this mentally. And I should probably shouldn't say people, I should say corporate cultures approach it. Uh -huh. um, there's from the automation layer up, like kind of a fixation on how am I going to get the machine data? And then, okay, so it's the machine and then the obsession with the data. And then by the time they get to the top of the stack where the business value is, it becomes very abstract and forgotten. You know, the kind of the steam is blown off and they, they don't have any energy left by that time. But Alex, the way he's talking about it, in my view, is a much more successful way where, and to your question, if the data and what you want to do with it for the business is your primary goal, and then you drill into the enabling technology that will get you there, it, it actually results in a far better approach to the digitization, which is why I think Dorigo has been so successful because there was that upper level vision that starts with the company and the customer. And then, okay, what are all the building blocks we need to get there? Not the other way around. Because the other route actually kind of ends, it, it often ends in a suboptimal solution uh, for the customer when you go from the bottom up. But yes, yeah. everybody is definitely seeing that. I mean, that's, that's what digitization is about, is, is everybody is now conditioned by our devices and mainstream applications on the web we all use and the fact that we can see our thermostats over the web and our, you know, is transparency of information is now simply expected. Um, so it, it's now cascaded into the uh, industrial world where I think we have to make the, as Dorigo is striving to do, make the factory transparent digitally. Yeah. And, you know, that trend, I, I think that transparency makes makes a lot of sense. But it feels like when we first started the Industry 4.0 debate, I don't know, seven years ago or something, um, and it's been going a long time. Um, but it felt like initially it was a lot about efficiency and we'd see these quantum leaps in, in terms of efficiency. And I think for OEMs, that was exciting because they should be able to derive cost saving from that. But I don't feel we've necessarily seen that. Um, and we do seem to have kind of moved much more to this transparency, traceability, all those important things, this idea of a kind of a, a glass factory. Do you see a lot of efficiencies coming through, Alex, that drive through in terms of value to, to your Definitely, customers? Definitely, like we see labor efficiencies, we see improved effective parts per million on the factory floor, all of these different areas. But it's, you bring up an, an interesting point about the reason companies are not necessarily seeing these huge leaps in productivity or efficiency gains, because the projects mm -hmm. are slightly different, um, is, is because they're leaping. Like we want to, at Dorigo, in some industries you want to be the leader, in some industries you want to be the fast follower. We're okay being a little bit behind that, right? So we can see where others are doing. And if you do that, then you make decisions that are defined on getting, and I think it's called uh, value realization. Are we getting mm -hmm. full value out of that asset, out of that system? With factory logics, 100% we are. Um, and now it's looking to how do we assemble chassis a little bit faster? And is there a robotic solution? And will we get full value out of that? I know, yeah. like, I think it happened in the 70s where everyone suddenly bought huge robots at a huge expense and they never saw the value. So then they gave up on it for a bit. And we're now back to the point where you can get a robotic arm by FedEx and program it overnight. And people have still gone a bit wild down that path. So they're spending all this money and it's not actually moving productivity forward. So I think yeah. the, the, the stage is what does the customer want? Is there a technology that can support us getting there? First do the foundational work. I, I, I have uh, intense debates with the 
one of our business analysts here and like, we need a new ERP system. He says, no, we need to do what we do well in our existing one before we roll onto that. And I think that's also a big part of it. If people will jump to this holy grail of industry 4.0, but at the end of the day, we build other people's great ideas. So how do we make it simpler and faster? And we, we're starting with, with factory logic is the primary yeah. tool for that. Yeah. Yeah, and how do you make it faster and better from there? Just curious, before I hand back to Eric, um, when you look at a digitally transformed factory, do you think that's a factory that was better prepared for the pandemic? I think... Hmm. I'm actually, I'm not, I think, I'm thinking right now how to answer that question. <laughs> uh, Jason, Jason what, do you, what do you think while yeah, Alex yeah. is thinking? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to steal your thunder, Alex. But uh, no, no, my thunder's not even started yet. That's going right, to take okay. a little bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's a great question because we actually saw it happen um, when you know we when the pandemic gripped all of businesses and everything. We Aegis was sitting there wondering, well, what can we do to help the customers? And we did. Uh, we offered surge licensing for people who were going to um, uh, free surge licensing that had to switch their production. To do something to support the medical uh, you know, problems mm -hmm. of COVID. And we actually had multiple customers take advantage of it and a couple published things that they went from building, one of them actually built defense and uh, oil and gas type equipment and started making ventilators. And they did a, a marketing piece in Europe that had they not had the digital platform, it would have been impossible for them to do that in the space of a few weeks because they just had no you know, they had no basis to be building that kind of product and switch over that quickly. Mm. And they, they put it completely on the digitization. The other aspect is, uh, well, there's probably two others. One is uh, remote work. Uh, the transparency of the information is not just analytics. Um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, Alex, actually some of your manufacturing engineers are continuously using factory logics at home. Yeah. So the process preparation where they would be in an office can now be done at home. Uh, and then there's the natural uh, effect of if, if you have a digitized factory, you're naturally going to have less staff on the floor. That's the efficiency part. So, you know, that does help with the pandemic, of course. Mm. Yeah, and I, I agree. So we are product engineers. Half of them are always working from home. They can still communicate with the factory floor. So in that respect, being down the digital path a bit further it's been a huge help, but I, but I also think if you even step it back, it's almost philosophical in a way is companies that have already been thinking about this have a different mindset anyway. One that's maybe more willing to change, you know, looking at direction. So that alone may have also helped through, you know, companies that are succeeding through this pandemic that have years ago started to consider this transition are also more willing to consider changes in, in maybe a more dynamic fashion. So it's, it's yeah. Too, and have a change management process. In. But I, I think that's an interesting yeah. point though, that the culture is naturally comfortable with change if they did the digitization as an early, uh, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. Hey, Jason, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it, it's great to have Alex kind of as a, as a poster child for you here, so to speak <laughs> about, about it. But so taking, you know, you know, Dorigo out of it, I'm curious about the challenges that people bring to you when they engage with, 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 with Aegis. What do they come to you for asking for? You know, what are the problems you're being asked to help them solve? Are they specific or is it more of a general type? There, there's, two, there's two things, two categories of challenges people come to us. And, and, one, and I could put it in a historical context. 15, 10 years ago, People came to us with generally specific uh, problems that could be associated to a module or a capability in our solution. So when we were in a uh, an engagement with a with a customer prospect, a prospective customer, it was I need to get the paper off the floor. I don't have whip tracking control, route enforcement. I could go on for quite some time, but it was generally one or a few functional issues that they had defined. But what happened, and I do think it, it coincided with Industry 4.0 in that people started thinking about efficiency and factories in general in a more abstract way. Uh, something very interesting happened to our business and our customers is that 
reduced in frequency. What then started was what Alex was talking about, people that were looking at change management, actual uh, continuous improvement. And they started, uh, what the challenge they then brought to us was, and I need to get pa uh, paper off the floor, it was, I have 25 different functional areas of this business that are all saying they need to do different things. I need to herd all those cats and get internal alignment. Mm. And I need a vendor with whom I can work as a, almost like a consultant as to how do all these business problems get aggregated and then a digitized solution can help all of them in one shot and then get everybody nodding in agreement that that is actually what the company needs. So it became more of what the, Alex was talking about, that top-down vision of what digitization is, that's been the last 10 years or so. And before that, it was more the bottom up. And what I do see um, is people who are still doing that bottom up approach where they're just saying, we need to get data off the machines. And they're saying that's yeah. industry 4.0, which it yeah. isn't. Um, it, that road ends poorly for them because they get the data off the machines and then everyone's looking around saying, why didn't we get the value from that investment? We just spent all that time and money and what happened because there was no, there was no end goal. It was yeah. a functional goal. So, yeah. um, so that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Data is definitely not a goal. Data is a, um, data is the <laughs> lubricant. Data is the data is what you need to get to the end, the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, so Alex, do you think with um, a lot of companies when they first think about industry 4.0, there's a paralysis in terms of trying to figure out what to do first? And do you think, a system the size of factory logic is a good first step. I mean, obviously, yep. previously yep. they were starting with single problems, but now it's it's more of a big picture issue. Yeah, I, and I think it's it's overwhelming to many companies. There's mm. so much out there. You're being bombarded with here's a device that can solve a problem. Here's a software solution that can solve a problem. So it it is difficult. Where do you start? Because it is exciting, and I'm mm. excited by it, and you can get really pulled into it. And I think to, to move beyond that paralysis, you just have to go back to what is the purpose of our business? How are we addressing it? And can any of these tools support the way we address it, right? It's not, you know, in your organization, if you have communication challenges, Slack, Teams, Zoom are not going to solve those things. You have to start working on the culture and then you can use those tools as enablers to mm -hmm. make that, that, that uh, a more easy leap. The thing I love about starting with Factory Logics, the way we've we've done here, is it touches all those people, process, technology. Some sometimes people throw systems in there, and it moves all of them forward. So you're not gaining value in one single location, you know, in an automation in a specific part of the factory. You're gaining it across the entire ecosystem, mm. which, I, which I think is incredible. And it's it's real. It's to me, it's a shocking time. So we're we're not the biggest business, but we're not the smallest. But with tools, and uh, I know Jason has lots of big customers, this puts us in the ring with them really quickly. Yeah. So if you're you know, a 10, 20, $100 million uh, EMS, now is the time because you can go head to head with everyone else, right? And the world is shifting more into this notion of, you know, forget the monolithic ERP, forget the monolithic manufacturer. How do we utilize Dorigo's phenomenal skills in high tech, you know, short runs to mm. an outsourced engineering services? And that's what Aegis is. Aegis is an ecos ecosystem and factory logics. And you get to jump into that and move along at your speed. Again, not, you know, you don't have to be breakneck. You can be a fast follower. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I really like that, that concept, Alex, of, um, you know, kind of matching the, Aegis ecosystem with your strategic goals, with your um, your ecosystem within the business of so getting people communicating in the right way, getting people thinking about efficiency, getting people thinking about the customer relationship in the right way, um, and that fitting in with the way the the world is changing. And I think you're right there. I think people that maybe wouldn't have entertained a Dorigo in the past, when they're looking at the their supply chain, they're looking at the agility they need, they're looking at the flexibility they need, they're more likely to come to you. And if they come to you and they see that you do have that mm -hmm. visibility through your business, then you suddenly become more attractive. 
yeah. um, you know, and yeah, like I would say, I would say, make you more attractive as well. I'd say, you know, an ERP system can help a company provide dependability. But when you look at speed, flexibility, dependability, mm. factory logics really throws in those other two, right? It is an execution yeah. system. Yeah. It's day to day operations and provides this pipeline of useful information. That's the other great thing about Jason's team is they know our industry. Hmm. You know, it's not a broad brush stroke of, you know, yeah. that's for everyone. And I think that's been a huge advantage to us working with, with Jason's team as well. They've been, you know, not just, uh, you know, we're not just a customer. They've been a bit of a guide and a coach as we, as we go through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'd love stuff. to interject here if I could for a second, because uh, as much as I, I, as I was listening to Alex talk about it, and while I love uh, the value they've gotten out of the system and, uh, and his comments, I actually, it occurred to me that I think Alex may not fully appreciate because he's embedded in Dorigo and what he's done with Factory Logics there and his team. Um, it isn't, I mean, I like to think our system's miraculous and wonderful and all that, obviously it's our system, but, uh, <laughs> but had the culture and the leadership in that company not had the, the vision and the approach that Alex has articulated here, it doesn't matter how incredible the software is. The deployment yeah. will, the deployment will work. The functions will work, but it won't become part of the mission of the company and the value that it, that it does, doesn't, it, you have a diminished output and results from the system. So I think because he's been so successful with looking at it from that perspective that he doesn't realize that sometimes it doesn't go that way. And it's the exact same product. It's the exact yeah. same solution. And the result is less because of the business side and the leadership. So I, I just wanted to point that out because you could put that exact same configuration of factory logics in another company that does not look at the business side of it the way he does and the results would not be the same. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. It's that alignment of the, um, you know, the culture and the vision and then having the tools in place to do it. And if you start with the tools and you don't have the culture and vision in place, it's just not going to happen, is it? And there's only as a vendor, and this is something I think for the audience, you know, no matter what solution you, you provide, the, the vendor can only do so much. Mm. We cannot force change inside an organization. We, we strive to do the best project management we can and communication and all that business. But in the end, if the customer isn't enthused and the leadership isn't engaged and the stakeholders don't, don't actually have that vision of what the value needs to be ultimately, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible for any vendor to make it really successful. So it is, yeah. it is really a 50-50 situation between the vendor and the, uh, and the customer with the deployment of any system like this. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I hear you speak about that, Jason, because <clears throat> you said that even somebody, the implementation, you'll gain benefits from it. The system is the system. It, it should generate some success and success then can, can breed complacency or excitement as a result of that, right? And uh, it's the excitement that is the ones that you're talking about, the ones who really take it to the next level. Mm. You know, they're, they're enthused by, by what they're seeing and they're saying, how can, how can we improve even more within our environment? And that's kind of what I get from Alex too, right? It's not like, okay, we got it done. We're okay now, right? So, I mean, do you see that happening in the engagements? I, I do is uh, there are there are companies that will be faced with a specific and it is a business problem like they, they can't deliver the traceability at the rate the customers are demanding or they had an incident or something like that, you know, and they will select the platform uh, because the system's modular, as Alex was saying, you can step through it. Um, and those folks will often get that solution. It will run brilliantly and everything will be fine and their business problem goes away, but they don't leverage it in the manner that Alex is describing, where it becomes part of the operation overall. And that's where a critical mass of you know, data and everything is achieved and all that value. But so I, I think I'm, I'm answering your question is yes, you can solve individual point pains yeah. with any system. Mm -hmm. um, but when it, when it hits a holistic platform, something else entirely happens, which is a, is a, is a multiplier on the value it has. Yeah. Yeah. And it allows you to project forward. And, you know, I, I, listening to Alex, I can see there's a passion there for manufacturing excellence and, and different parts of it. And you mentioned a few things earlier. You mentioned 
automation and how excited you got every time there's a, there's a opportunity to, to do something with robotics or whatever else. And you also mentioned AI. I was curious how you're developing those strategies and how that fits in with, with what you've got with factory logics. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's interesting. And I can't name the university, let's call it the leading Canadian university. Um, but uh, with our founder and myself, we're actually engaging with them to be uh, primary funders in their smart factory, a launch of a master's program with that. Okay. And part of that is looking at taking our factory lines and now saying, we have the software solution. How do we get full value out of automation? And we are very high mix. Like I love those bright machines. Every time I mm-hmm. see a D one, I'm thinking we, I probably need to get one or two. Um, <laughs> and, but we have to really understand that full value proposition for that. So we're going to be working with one uh, with the university on helping us through that. Right, with people that are much smarter than myself, is look at these lines, look at the mix of what we do. What are the right tools? And should we actually design some of our own to support that? So it's it's being seen, Dorigo, we're being called the, the living lab for this university. And we're just going through those, those conversations. We've been going on for about eight months now, which is exciting. From the AI standpoint, from uh, Factory Logics, we know how long it takes to build a product. We know our machine times. We know all of this. You can start to look at companies, whether it be Amazon Web Services or these machine learning tools, to start to do, to be predictive in, ah, customer X needs 10 boards on this day. What does the resorting look like and how will that adjust to new dates? Uh, and I did that in my previous company. It was our Skunk Works project on that, but that'll be one of our, our next kind of holy grails of, of that dynamic planning where it's, you know, we would want an accuracy rate of 90% on a, on a due date because it is, we have, you know, 70, 80 different, jobs on the floor at any time it's very complex our environment um so let's use use some uh, good modeling good algorithms and the data to start generating those returns that we can then share with the customers mm-hmm. yeah yeah and you can collect all that data yeah the thing that jason i'm sure you and i have discussed this many times but the the power of data is phenomenal the power of data that Dorigo have is one thing. The power of the data that flows through factory logics globally is kind of just off the charts. Is there any AI, is there any value that can be derived from that for, you know, almost like the members of the community in terms of uh, of using that data to improve their processes? It's, it's interesting uh, you say that. Our CTO um, spends a lot of his life these days uh, contemplating the application of AI to our databases. Mm. And I think you're, if I understand you correctly, the databases in some of our larger customers gets uh, very, it's populated with a huge amount of data to begin with. And mm. then if you start going to multi-site enterprises and our, our data warehouses that we have at the enterprise level, and then you start joining that possibly to a community, it does yeah. become a huge amount. And what, what we're seeing, um, Alex is, is, he has a particular love of planning and he has a, a great deal of knowledge of that. And I think that his, his focus is how to use AI to refine planning yeah. automatically with real data as the basis and, and all of that. And I think that's brilliant. Um, there's another thing we're seeing is just real time process data that's flying into the systems and mainly humans, but also mainly the, the IOT feeds that we have. Um, analytics is hitting a barrier where there's only so much analytics can do because eventually the analytics is on a screen and a human is looking at it and humans are not good at seeing patterns in huge amounts of data. I mean, this is just a, this fundamental thing we know now, um, the, the possibilities of applying AI to seeing the patterns in the factory logics ontology, that central data store we have, uh, are huge. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out where we want to apply it right now. But we do mm. think that's the future where instead of expecting a human to look at some kind of analysis and draw yeah. a conclusion, the system will proactively reach out to the human and say, we think we're seeing anomalies or patterns in these areas that you know you need to look into further. Um, that's, that's Right now, that's where we think the promise is on, uh, on mining the data in our system with AI. Mm. You agree with that, Alex, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a big fan of Jason's thoughts on that. It's, uh, but again, I can get overwhelmed and run down a, 
my own little tunnel of wanting to do things at times. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, let, let me ask you, Alex, we're talking about the human side, and I'm kind of curious, you know, so the op and, on the executing of Industry 4, how was it implementing this system? How was it for, for your workers adapting to it, you know, training them in the process? Tell us about how that is. So we, we, so we made the mistake every company makes and every company will likely continue to make over and over and over again. We trained everyone times 20 and we still didn't do enough training. And I think that, and I, I don't know, like it's, it's in my brain, but I still don't know why we don't process it enough that really you have to bring everyone along in this. You know, you often get these misconceptions of, oh, they're young, they know how to operate all of these systems. Oh, they're there. And it's, you have to, to, to really approach everyone from this and build this baseline up. You know, you, you get all of this data, it's confusing. What does data mean? How do you read data, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we did a great job at sharing the why, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. We did an okay job at the training where we were successful when we caught ourselves is we rolled it out first in SMA. So surface mount assembly or S the SMT operations, right? And we learned a lot through that. And that's where we started to see, we need to accelerate the training a bit more, spend more time. And it went from, you know, weekly reviews with the operators. What are they experiencing to daily? Give us the feedback. What are you experiencing in this system? Uh, do we need more scanners? Do we need to change how we're logging in? And these, and by the time we got through to the back end operations for you know box build and final assembly, we'd honed that skill. But it's, uh. I mean, everything you read is train, mm -hmm. right? You most value spend spend all your resources on your workforce. You will get the greatest value. And we did that, but we still could have done more. Um, yeah. and, and also the basic, you know, whether you look at Cotter's change management, right? We identified the supporters, we identified those who would not support, right? And we spent our time, you know, educating them, right? Getting those who would bang the drum for going digital. Um, and for those who, who wouldn't bang the drum, we softened their, their negativity, right? Around it. Mm -hmm. um, overall, it did go really well, but it's just training, training, training. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a huge educational process, isn't it? And, um, you know, I was curious about this from uh, from Jason's point of view, from Aegis' point of view, how you how you do this, because you've got to educate and inspire, and you've got to do that in the boardroom and on the factory floor. So it's a really broad level of communication you've got to undertake, and you've got and that's got to be continuous because people are going to, you know, start as evangelists, and then maybe their heads are going to drop because it, the installation hasn't delivered what they expected right away and you've got to pick them up and push them in the right direction what what's your role in that process jason um it's it's a it's a great point because i think as a company in the last five years we we realized we needed to uh we yeah, obviously we always focused on our project management and things like that but uh we've made major investments that we're listening to alex it's interesting because uh not actually we purchased knowledge management software systems. We hired people who were experts in education. Uh, and then we formed an entire department that was just for documentation and education. Because uh, we, as the system grew so enormous, we weren't supporting our customers adequately on the education side. And we realized we needed to, everything Alex said, it's so incredibly important. Um, so that was one thing we did. That was kind of the the block and tackle knowledge basis of basic training. But what you're talking about is something that I think is even more important in some ways is the, I guess you'd say the psychology of the deployment. Mm -hmm. What we have, we actually document this in our PowerPoints and kickoff meetings is it's very important to get rapid visible wins that are appealing to everyone from corporate stakeholders to the folks operating the system on the floor um, so that the, mo the emotional momentum of the system has something, you, you can't just sit everyone in a room and train them and tell them the abstractions about how great this is going to be for the company and don't show them anything. Like uh, they need to start seeing reports right away and they, ne they need to start seeing really cool real-time dashboards. And uh, one thing I've seen is if you can get, uh, say, I've actually had personal experience with this with uh, uh, some folks on a shop floor in New Hampshire and one of our customers, the people in quality were not verbalizing, but you could tell from body language, very worried about going from 
paper arrows for quality to a glass-based system on, in, in a monitor. Really worried about it. They just they, and when they realized and we proved to them that their job was going to get easier, faster, it they completely transformed them. So the the goal is to rapidly get everybody involved to see that things are actually going to be better and easier and so forth. And then it just carries you forward through all those mm -hmm. hiccups and problems and uh, with delays on the server coming in or whatever, whatever deployment problem is going on, they'll, they'll overlook that if they're seeing the new benefits coming out quickly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so aligning that implementation with the vision and giving Alex and the team all the tools to, to be able to do that. And I, you know, I love Alex's point that, that you know, you focused on, on, on training, you did lots of training, you did more training and you still didn't do it. You still training. failed the training. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. So just train, train, train. No, I think it's, I think it's a great point because I think it's essential to any kind of change, man, change management, particularly, particularly with digital transformation, okay. particularly with any digital tool, you know, the more you train on it, the more you're going to get out of it. And the, you know, the happier you're going to be with that outcome. There's, a, there's another thing about the change management, and Alex will probably speak to this more, more than I can, but I know it's important to us, is that we try to remain cognizant of what we've observed is that the, the goals of, say, the executive layer or the stakeholders in the company is, are often very different as you go through the organization. If you take mm. each, each strata of the organization, the goals are very different. And if you, aren't, if you don't remain respectful of them during the project, things tend to go badly because they aren't normally aligned because everybody has different motivations and so forth. So we like to have, make sure the deployment is providing uh, evidence of value that is different for each one of those parties as we go forward. I don't know whether you, you focused on that, Alex, but I mean, we should have been, <laughs> I certainly hope that came through in the process. <laughs> no, we did. We definitely did. Yeah. It's like looking, looking through this, you know, I look at the, the factory logic system and I say, you know, it's benefited the people, right? We no longer have teams running around looking for folders. We're engaging more and empowering the teams because they can now communicate, you know, directly in with product product engineers. And especially during COVID, this this has been a been a huge help. Um, it highlights training. Where do we need to add training based on the quality input, right? It's improved our processes because it's it's forced us to refresh all our processes. Do we need all those operational steps? You know, because you you have to you have to define that. And again, we're getting data on where is the process slow. You know, theory of constraints, right? Where's our constraint happening? How do we address that faster? Mm -hmm. And then we're now into the technology side of whether it be Koyang, Panasonic, or Typhoon washing equipment, where we're we're starting to connect that and getting more information on OEE and those sort of aspects. So it's it's really been a been a huge win. And I'd, I'd say my recommendation to everyone is. You have to start now. Please start slowly. And I recommend starting with a software type solution because it's so scalable. You know, we yeah. have 90 uh, computers on our factory floor today uh, with, you know, running factory logics. And I don't know the, the starting point, Jason, but I'm sure you can start at 10 and scale it and grow it with your business, right? Even less, even less. You know, we, yeah. we have customers that began with a, a 10 seat system. Mm -hmm. And I think they probably would be shocked if they knew how many terminals are actually running because, you know, the company grew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good. Gentlemen, I got, I'm cognizant of the time here and, you know, Alex kind of stole some thunder there. I was going to ask what your recommendation would be for the audience here in conclusion. And, you know, Alex just naturally jumped right into that there, but. Uh, well, I was looking at the time too, Eric. I know I was like, oh, I better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll slip it which, in. Yeah. Which one of you is Eric? <laughs> the good looking one that's it no, please but no but you know but we do need to wrap but i guess i would like still like to ask because there there has been this misconception about industry 4.0 and you know so i'd like you you know what would your recommendation advice be to the to people in the audience who, who maybe are still not quite sure and where to start and how to do you know jason what would your advice be to people out there to how to benefit here it, it's, it's a scary question because I can tell you I've actually had multiple meetings over the last few years. Uh, actually, no, I would say within the two-year time frame because you know there was the, the hype period with the Industry 4.0 and then now we're in a kind of a different phase. I'm not sure which one it is, but 
Um, I've had multiple executives opening a meeting saying, I don't want to hear industry 4.0 used as a term in this meeting because they're starting to feel that the meaning of it has gotten so diluted and variable that it actually was distracting from their corporate effort to digitize, which I think is a shame. But I have, I can't believe I've heard that multiple times now where they want to talk about. So, so in a way, I would recommend that people maybe, maybe not as severe as that, but don't obsess over defining what Industry 4.0 is for you. Obsess over what digitization and the future state of your business. Like that comes through in everything Alex has been saying, I think, is that he had a future state in mind that yeah. involved a digitization platform. He wasn't putting labels on it or trying to force it into a certain mold. It was what his business needed. And then he figured out how to get it done. That's how I would recommend it is not mm -hmm. to not to get wrapped around all these definitions and um, and certainly not to, as I mentioned previously, try not to come from the bottom up, come from those mm -hmm. business values and the goal and the future state you have envisioned and work down into the enablers. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way doesn't work out too well. So that would be my my elevator pitch on, on how to approach it. Very yeah. good. Alex, anything to add to that other than train, train, train? No, I think, I mean, Jason stated it perfectly, so I have nothing more to add to that. I think it's, it's the perfect approach Jason has said, and it's kind of the, the direction we've been following. Yeah, yeah it's, it's eyes on the prize, isn't it? You've got to focus on where you want, where you want to be. And, and, you know, as Alex said, it is a journey. You're not just going to get to the end and think, we're done. We, we made it to Industry 4.0. It's, it's a continuous journey and there'll be new tools and new solutions that come along the way. So you've got to be open to those and you've got to be a little bit evangelic about the whole process, I think. And um, yeah. those companies that have had those really strong evangelists internally on digital transformation and don't get bogged down with the terms or what they need to call it, just what the customers are going to benefit from it are the ones that have really won. Um, through this process and generally they're the ones that have been the most agile and resilient in the turbulent disruptive times we've been through and you know there's more disruption coming we just don't know what it is yet so yeah. having something that prepares you for that is hugely valuable good good well jason alex thank you both for taking time sharing your thoughts and insights with our audience i'm sure they appreciate it uh to our audience out there um both those listening now and those who are going to hear this one, it's rebroadcast. Uh, he is Jason. He is Alex. You can find them both on uh, LinkedIn or at their company websites, I'm sure. If you have questions, any interest in connecting with them, I would encourage you to do so. Um, I think this has been highly valuable, and I'd like to, again, thank both of you for your time and, and sharing with, it, with our audience today. So thank you both, and I wish you a successful 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.